Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We hope today's message provides practical guidance to help you deepen your relationship with God. To follow along with the Life Notes, you can download them at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, let's hear from the pastor. You can have a seat. I'm Pete. I am uh, one of the pastors here. I'm glad to be here with you today. And um, I want to just invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps. Open to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. And if you happen to be using the Bibles that are in the seats in front of you, that's on page 1143. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you are welcome to take that with you because we want you to have God's Word. We want you to read God's Word because we know that if you do that, it's going to change your life. Uh, for our online community, I am so glad that you are with us and want to encourage you. If you need a Bible, message your host, and we'll make sure we get one out to you. It uh, won't be before the sermon's over, but eventually we'll get you a Bible. Um, it's great to be with you, and I want to just kind of open up our time by asking you a question about how do you say, I give up? So it kind of defeated, oh, I give up. I just can't take it anymore. Or maybe it's, I've had enough. Or maybe you're the strong and silent type and you just turn around and walk away. I mean, we've, we've all said, I give up. We've all given up at some point on something for some reason. Sometimes the reasons are good, sometimes they're bad. Um, I've given up on playing the piano two times. <laughs> when I was in third grade, um, the instructor's daughter stared at me through the whole lesson. And it took two lessons, and I'm like, I'm not going back there. I was just so uncomfortable and creeped out that she would just stare at me during my lesson. Uh, then I started playing piano again in high school, and I played for a year and a half. And that's just enough time where you're actually starting to, it's starting to become enjoyable, like you can actually play something. Uh, but I got busy in my senior year. I'm like, you know, I'm done playing the piano and I quit again. And you know, quitting that instrument has come with regret because I still wish I could play piano, you know, but I can't because I quit. We, of course, are tempted to give up on bigger things too. Uh, there's a the possibility of giving up on a career or a job. Uh, there's the temptation to give up on relationships. We've probably considered giving up on church. I know I have. I've had times where I've considered giving up on church. And tragically, some in this room might even be contemplating giving up on life or giving up on your faith in Christ. Well, today's message is going to encourage you to keep your faith and to not give up. The struggles that we face, no doubt, are the things that motivate us to quit. It could be physical or health struggles that we just don't think we can endure any longer. It could be relational turmoil at home or in the church that you don't want to put up with anymore. There might be a long list of unmet expectations that you have brought you to the point where you just say, should I keep going? I don't think I can keep going. Today's passage is going to motivate us to not give up, especially on those super important issues of life and faith. So the message today was delivered to the messed up church in the city of Corinth. And I'm guessing that this church had probably had just about enough. They were failing on so many levels. They were suing one another in court. Um, they were arguing about who their favorite leader was. They were putting up with sexual sin inside the church. Uh, people were gluttons and drunkards when it came to celebrating communion. Uh, they were misusing and abusing their spiritual gifts. And as we learned last week, some people in the church had even stopped believing in the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, that's a pretty core Christian doctrine. And there's people in the church that are saying, nah, we don't believe it. So of course, they would be ready to call it quits. You could probably even imagine some of the conversations that would go on on the way out the door. Did you see Claudius? Did you see how he was bragging as he used his spiritual gift? And then someone else chimes in, yeah, and the Thomas family got drunk today at communion. I'm done. 
I can't take this anymore. I'm never coming back here. Paul writes some hope-filled words to the people in this church. They are words that are meant to encourage and to inspire, and they're intended to help people keep going. And what we'll see as we look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 15 is we're going to see that Paul gives us two theological truths and then a practical implication. Okay, so we're going to read that right now, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I'll be starting in verse 50 and going to verse 58. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's really good, isn't it? We could probably just sit here and read this about 20 times and let it minister to us, but I'm gonna share just a few words here, the first thing that we see is one theological truth, and that is that change is coming. Change is coming. You know, in your life notes last week, or in your life groups, you may have discussed the difference between the perishable man and the imperishable man. The difference between those of us living just in this earthly body and the coming resurrection body that Jesus promises us who believe in him. So you had a chance to look at that last week, but I wanna to just touch a little bit on some questions that we might have about this coming change, this coming transformation. Um, why will we be changed? Why? Well, we're gonna be changed because change is needed. We are flesh and blood. Our bodies are corrupted by sin and disease and this body doesn't get to go to heaven. It doesn't get to inherit the imperishable and the eternal existence in heaven. So it needs to be changed. We need to receive a different body. We one day, if we're trusting in Jesus, will dwell in heaven and we need a body that is fit for that. We need an imperishable body. So how will this happen? Well, it says that it will happen quickly and in the blink of an eye, in the twinkle of an eye. It's kind of like the idea of as fast as an eye can blink, that's how quickly this change will take place and we will be transformed. It's kind of like getting dressed. You know, when you watch a magician and they spin around and then they're in totally different clothes? It's kind of like that idea that God will instantly dress us in what is imperishable. He will instantly dress us in immortality. That is really good news. Um, and you know, this has happened before. This has happened before. In the book of Genesis, it talks about a man named Enoch. And it says that Enoch walked with the Lord and then he was no more, like that quickly. Enoch walked with the Lord and then he was no more. Everyone else in Genesis dies. He dies, he dies, he dies, he dies. Enoch walks with the Lord and then he was no more. Quickly in the twinkling of an eye. Um, Elijah, one of the first major prophets for the nation of Israel. And um, Elijah, it says, is caught up in a, a chariot of fire. And his, his, uh, his, his protege, Elisha, got to watch him just go up to heaven. He didn't have to die. So we have this happening very quickly. 
Well, what will this new body be like? Another question, what will this new body be like? Well, it's going to be like the resurrection man, like the man of heaven. Now, this is kind of cool. This is exciting. So some of us, and probably most of us in this room, you know, we're, we're going to die. And then, if we're in Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes back, our bodies are going to be resurrected. We're going to get this new resurrection body that's going to be immortal and imperishable. But some of us, if we're around, in the day when Jesus comes back, he's just going to take us up, and he's going to transform us. Philippians 3, 20 through 21, listen to what it says. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Jesus is going to transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. When you read that resurrection story of Jesus rising from the dead and you hear all the cool things that he does, um, that's a glimpse of what we get to experience and we get to look forward to, a glorious body like Jesus. And so this week in your life groups and in your life notes, you'll get to take a look at what words described Jesus in his resurrected body. And you'll get to use some of that sanctified imagination to think about what that might mean for us when we receive that new body. Now, I know um, probably everyone here is going, okay, Pete, when is this going to happen? Tell me, when is this going to happen? I'm not going to do that. Um, but hey, there's, there's basically three main views, right? This is commonly called the rapture. That's a word that if you search in your Bible app for the word rapture, you're not going to find it in the Bible. If you look in your Bible concordance in the back, you're not going to find the word rapture because it's not a biblical word. It's a word that was added to our Christian vocabulary about 100 years ago to, to indicate the taking up of the church, this transformation that Jesus will do for believers. And there's three views on when this will happen. There's the pre-trib view, which says this is going to happen uh, before a period of seven years where things get bad on earth and there's tribulation and there's trial. So there's the pre-trib view. There's the mid-trib view, which basically says before things get really bad, sometime in the middle of that seven years, it's going to happen. And then there is the post-trib view, which is at the end of that tribulation period, that's when this will happen. And Christ will come back and he will take up the believers and transform them. There's also my favorite view, which is the pan-trib view, which basically says it's all gonna pan out in the end and we'll know, <laughs> we'll know which one is right uh, when it happens, right? Um, but um, Wayne Grudem, one of my favorite theologians, he says these issues are pretty complex when it comes to theology. It's pretty complex. And we need to extend a large measure of grace towards those who hold different views. And here within the Calvary staff and within Calvary Church, we have people that hold to all different of those views, right? And, and so we want to extend a lot of grace when it comes to this topic. But I'll just point out that I think in this verse, I have to at least address a little bit of what's in this verse. This verse says that it happens at the last trumpet. Listen, listen, listen to verse 52 and look at it if you've got your Bible open. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So, you know, that the, the, they're basically, this is the, the, the chronology. The trumpet sounds, the dead are raised, and we are changed, those who remain. So uh, the question really is, well, when is the last trumpet, right? That becomes the really hard, hard question. And um, I'm gonna leave that up to you guys, okay? I have some extra reading in the extended reading at the bottom of your life notes. You can read some of that and you can kind of decide, you know, when is it talking about that last trumpet? When does that fit? I'm not gonna answer that question because the most important thing for us to know is that change is coming. 
Change is coming, and that should be giving us some hope. The second theological point that Paul brings up here is that death is defeated. Death is defeated. Look at verse 55. This is beautiful. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? I love the imagery of death being swallowed up. Because, I mean, it's Halloween, so what do we see as we drive around town? We see graves swallowing up people, right? Or we see a skeleton sticking up out of, you know, skeleton hands sticking up out of the ground. Like, we have this idea that death is swallowing us up. And even in society as a whole right now, death is kind of glorified. Death is seen as an escape from this world. But in truth, death is only an escape for a believer in Jesus Christ. For a Christian, death does not swallow us up. No, death has been swallowed up in victory. Jesus defeated death for us. So the only people who don't need to fear death are those who are in Jesus Christ. Sin has made death inevitable for us all. Law has made the reality and the conviction of sin evident in our own life. God's law over and over and over again shows that we sin and that we are going to die for that sin. According to the Bible, existence, our existence does not end when we die. The Bible tells us that after death comes judgment. You might know Hebrews 9:27 just as it is appointed once for men to die, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So after death comes judgment. But Jesus, right? That's the encouraging part right there. But Jesus... We don't have to fear judgment. We don't have to fear condemnation from the law or from death because of what Jesus did. One of my favorite passages, Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. So for those who are in Christ Jesus, trusting in what he did, we don't fear. We don't fear death. We don't fear judgment because he has already won the battle. So when you think about death, what do you think about? Does death seem like a defeat to you? Do you still worry what will happen to you after you die? Do you think that death just ends your existence? Or maybe you think, that after we die, everything's just good for everyone. If you're clinging to any of those thoughts about death, you're out of alignment with what the scripture teaches us. We need to trust in Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He died on the cross for your sin. And when we have faith and we turn to Jesus and we follow him, he gives us this amazing gift of eternal life. And if this body dies, we're promised a home in heaven. And if we are here when he comes back, we are promised that this earthly body will be transformed so we can enter into that heavenly home. That is great hope. That is great peace. And I hope it moves you to be grateful, and I hope it moves you to be relaxed, knowing that you're on Jesus' team. There's an invitation for you today. If you don't know for sure that Jesus is your Savior, if you don't know for sure that death is defeated for you because you've trusted in Jesus, today is the day just to make that decision, to put all your eggs in the Jesus basket, to trust him, to believe on him, And if you're doing that today for the first time, please come and talk to one of the pastors out in the foyer at the end of the service. Come up here and talk to the prayer team at the end of the service. Let us, let somebody know you're making that decision because we wanna celebrate with you, we wanna pray with you because that would be awesome. 
So we have two theological truths that Paul has given us. Change is coming and death is defeated. So how are we supposed to live in light of this? The encouragement that Paul gives us is don't give up. Don't give up. Look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brother, so that therefore connects it back, right? To everything he just said. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So victory over death motivates us to press on. Victory over death gives us this hope that we don't have to give up. We started today considering that temptation to give up, and that is a real temptation, not just for hobbies or diets or exercise or jobs or relationships. It is a real temptation to give up on our life, to give up on going to church, to give up on our faith, because life is hard. Things don't go as planned. And even when we trust in Jesus and even when we're following Jesus, the road of our life is rarely smooth. There are going to be gigantic obstacles in our way. There are going to be some very big challenges that we have to face. But in light of this coming transformation, in light of the coming victory over death, the Bible encourages us not to give up to press on, and it does it with three phrases. The first one is be steadfast. Be steadfast. This is the idea of holding steady. Don't turn back to an old way of thinking or an old way of living. Don't divert course. Keep your direction of trusting Jesus, following Jesus, and looking forward to that eternal hope that we have in him. If you think about a ship, in the middle of the great vast ocean and the gigantic waves coming against it and strong winds pushing against it and turbulent currents coming against it, the captain of that ship wants to be steadfast, right? Wants to reach the dedication and a destination. And even though the waves and the wind can be pushing against it, the captain will use all of those navigational tools so that the ship stays on course, that the ship is steadfast. Paul gives us the same challenge. All of these theological truths that we're talking about are aimed at keeping us steadfast, in the right direction, looking forward to what Jesus has done to us and pressing forward to that ultimate goal. So the encouragement is be steadfast. The next encouragement is to be immovable. Be immovable. That's an idea of being firmly planted. Don't let philosophy or influencers on social media or people on TV try to convince you of something else. Try to get you to believe in something other than Jesus. Winds of doctrine and the influence of others around you will try to get you to think something different, but don't move. Hold tight to God. Hold tight to this book and what it teaches you. It promises you that you are going to be changed, so keep on waiting for God to do that work. I started out today talking about that silly illustration of me quitting piano. As a little kid, it just took one other little kid watching me during a lesson for me to quit. That's all it took. And, and we will encounter that same thing. We'll have family and friends look at us weird, give us quizzical looks, wonder why in the world we're believing in Jesus. Why are we doing the things we're doing? And we'll be like, uh, maybe I should tone it down. Maybe I should quit this Jesus thing. Everyone thinks I'm a weirdo. Don't give up because of the weird looks of people around you. When I was in high school, I quit because I got too busy. Well, that is a parable for our day, isn't it? How busy are we? How many things do we cram into our lives? And the more things we cram into our lives, we push Jesus back. We think Jesus is not important right now. This is not important. There's other things more important. I don't need to be at church. I don't need to go to life group. I don't need to go to CR. I'm busy. I don't need to read my Bible today. 
Don't give up because you just cram so much stuff into your life. Be immovable. Don't stop believing. And finally, Paul says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So if you believe that death is defeated, if you believe that you're going to be changed and enter into heaven, into an eternal kingdom, Paul says to abound in the work of the Lord. And he says that this work is not in vain. The work that you do when you're abounding in the work of the Lord is not in vain because it really matters. Because what you're doing when you're working for the Lord is you're bringing other people along into that transformation, right? You're bringing other people along so they know Jesus and they get to have that same eternal hope that you have. So abound in the work of the Lord. Let me give you an illustration that I think helps make this picture. Um, raise your hand if you watch the Super Bowl occasionally. You're kind of one of those. Okay, look at that. All right, lots of people. Okay, um, how many of you watch the Super Bowl because you like the commercials and the snacks at the party? Okay, so this is my crowd right here that just raised their hand. Okay, we're, we're watching the Super Bowl because we want to see the commercials and we want a good laugh and we want to have some good chips and dip. Um, and we don't care much about who wins the game doesn't matter who's playing. We don't care. And when the game is over, we're like, oh, which color was that? Um, and, and we aren't going to think about it again. You know, that's it. We're done. How many of you watch to root for a particular team? Okay. Okay. There's a lot of you. That's good. So you care more about the end. The whole game, you're cheering for your particular team. And at the end of the game, you're going to celebrate a bit you'll definitely be celebrating more than the people who are there for the commercials because they're just thinking, I can't wait for the commercials to do a rerun, you know? Okay, so then how many of you are willing to fork over some money to actually get in the stadium? A lot less because it's a lot of money, isn't it? Okay, but if you fork over that money to get into the stadium, you are going to be invested in that game. You are going to be celebrating when your team wins and you're going to try to get into the after parties, right? You're gonna to try to get into those after parties to celebrate. Now, what about the teammates? Then there's the actual football players. These are the ones that are on the team. They're playing the game, they're working hard. And when they win, they are really going to celebrate, right? They're the ones that get the ring, they get the trophy, they get the money, and they get the after parties. And they're the ones that get to say, I'm going to Walt Disney World after the game is over, right? They're the ones that really get to celebrate. Now, imagine this. What if you could be guaranteed the Super Bowl win? Like you knew the team that was gonna win and you had an invitation to be on that team. I'd be like, yes, sign me up. I mean, I don't even play football, but I'd be like, yes, sign me up. I will get the water. I will pick up the dirty towels. Let me be pummeled by the other team because I don't care because at the end, I get the Super Bowl championship. I get the ring, I get the trophy, I get the money, I get the parties, and I get to go to Walt Disney World, okay? You know, you will put up with anything when you know you win in the end. We have that same spiritual invitation. Spiritually, through Jesus Christ, we win. God has won the victory through Jesus Christ. And death, Satan, evil, destruction, they're all the losers. They lose. We are invited to be on the winning team. So in faith, let me encourage you, rest in Jesus. Rest in all that he's done for you. We're not earning this. The game is over. Satan has lost. Jesus has won. And so Paul says now, abound in the work of the Lord. Abound in the work of the Lord. So there are so many people that serve tirelessly here at Calvary. It is amazing how they serve. They're here every service. They're here every weekend. They're here throughout the week. And they are tirelessly abounding in the work of the Lord because they want to bring other people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So this question isn't for them. But if you don't know if you're that person, let me ask you, what is the work that you're doing to abound in the work of the Lord? 
What is it that's taking your time that is abounding in the work of the Lord? And now, if you're a believer in Jesus, and your answer is, I abound at keeping the brown cushion underneath me warm, <laughs> that needs to change. That needs to change. Your body is heading for transformation to dwell in heaven. So start using your body for the kingdom of God. It's time to stoop down like this and get eye to eye with some kids and start telling them about Jesus. It's time to open your mouth and start talking to some youth and to the people in your life about all the great things Jesus has done. It's time to reach out your hand and start shaking hands at those doors and welcoming people into this room so that they can hear about Jesus. It is time for you to maybe start looking out and join the team of people that's trying to keep us safe and healthy here. Maybe it's time to start using those arms and moving these chairs on Friday because there's a team of men that would love to have your help moving these chairs every week. We have to use our bodies because God's going to change them. And we have that promise. And so let's use them for the kingdom. Let's abound in the work of the Lord. Can you imagine, just with me, this weekend there's going to be about 3,000 people that are gonna hear this message, that are going to be associated with Calvary in some way. Can you imagine how Lake Havasu, Parker, Mojave County, and the world will change if we abound in the work of the Lord? Because we're gonna win. The battle's done. That is something that's worth joining the team and getting busy. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we um, just come before you and we uh, confess right now that this is convicting. It is convicting to me because how often do I forget the great glory that waits for us in heaven? How often do I forget that this decrepit body that's weak and gets sick, that, that it's gonna be transformed? Whether that's in my resurrection body or whether that's just in a transformation that will take place Lord, those are great hopes. And Lord, we want it to motivate us today. We want it to motivate us to not give up. Whatever hard and difficult situation the people in this room are in, whatever we're facing in our life, Lord, we give it to you right now. We give it to you and we say, it's yours. You've won the victory, so I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna hold fast to you, Jesus. I'm gonna hold on to life because you've given it to me. I'm gonna hold on to faith because it is my hope for eternity. And even though this church is messed up, I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna be abounding in the work because it's not in vain. Lord, thank you for this message. Let it encourage us, let it change us and motivate us to a full life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If today's message spoke to you and you would like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.